He has a PhD in materials engineering. He spent 25 years in America, working with top companies and building a number of equipment. To his credit, 22 US issued patents. Now back in Ghana, Professor Fred Magbagonlore is helping develop the next generation of African innovators who will solve Africa's problems. He is the president of Academic City College in Accra, Ghana. Following the outbreak of the coronavirus, he has taken on another challenge, which is to prove to Africans that they are more than capable of solving their own problems. Critically ill coronavirus patients need to be put on ventilators to help them breathe, but the ventilators are expensive. In fact, they are in short supply at the moment worldwide. But Professor Mark Bagonlori says Africa is capable of producing low-cost ventilators for its own needs. He has built a prototype in a matter of weeks, and he says with just 10,000 US dollars, his low-cost ventilators could be made available in health facilities across Ghana and possibly other African countries. The ventilators have become a major topic globally. They are too expensive and apparently the world wasn't producing enough of them. In this crisis period, they are said to be going for anything between 50 and 55,000 US dollars. But Professor Mark Bagonlore says what he is working on can be acquired for just under 200 US dollars. Of course, with add ons, the price would be higher. Having worked as Director of Research and Development and Director of IT at Siemens Medical, and having held other top positions in Fortune 500 companies in the US. Professor Mark Bagonlori says there is nothing Africa cannot do on its own if we got serious about it. So I'd like to start with the, the biology of things and a disease condition. So when a patient gets the COVID-19, what is happening here is that the alveoli in their lungs, some parts, some of them are filled with fluids. Others two are okay, some are collapsed. So the, what the ventilator is supposed to do is to recover the collapsed ones and also maintain the ones that are okay. So what they need is a constant supply of air into the lungs. So now let's come back to so What's happening here is that this is serving as the air generator, right? So the air is generated from this side goes into what we call the humidifier what this does is that it moistens the air so that you don't send dry air to the patient so from the humidification it comes into the lungs then that is the inhalation cycle so now the patient will have to what will have to exhale so then the patient will exhale from the lungs it will go to something we call the peep valve so the PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. What that is supposed to do is to prevent the lungs from collapsing totally again. So at each point in time, there's still air in the lungs. You don't want all the air leaving the lungs. So this PEEP will prevent that from happening by keeping a positive pressure here. Then from there, it goes into the scrubber. What the scrubber is doing is that because the exhaled air might contain the COVID-19 viruses, you don't want it into the atmosphere because it might infect the other people around. So you pass it through this chamber and this chamber, it will kill all the viruses before the air comes out so that you don't reinfest the people around. So this is the basic design uh, for the, the prototype. So basically, we are going to have a mechanism which you are going to see later. This, we are going to have a mechanism that will be driving this pump, right? So the mechanism will be driving the pump up and down. The mechanism will be driving the pump up and down. So as it drives, the lungs get inflated and then the inhalation and the exhalation cycles occur. So basically, that is how it works. One of the things that we could also do here is instead of the manual piston, we could have an oxygen tank, a pressurized oxygen tank, delivering the air to the patient. So this is a basic infrastructure that you can reconfigure in different ways, you know. 
So in a remote area, you could actually have a family member sitting down there and pumping it because there's no electricity. You know, so that would be the lowest of the low cost. And then you could have a solar system controlling this. Or you can have your basic battery pack controlling this. Uh, and you can use the water and the air combination here to drive this, or you can use pressurized oxygen to do that. So what you will see next is a different mechanism for generating the same air. And we basically designed that out of repurposed material in our environment, which is leather for generating, uh, for creating a bellow that generates the air, and then also using a repurposed windshield wiper. Right, so let me show you what we have. And then, so what you see here is a, it's a windshield wiper motor, right there. Okay, there's nothing magical. You can see it's still very quite dirty. We just harvested it, and this is leather. Okay, so can we see a demo here? Okay. So we're using a car battery right now to power it. So this will generate the air that the build it. Yeah. No. And this thing is about you know maybe five hundred to eight hundred milliliter range, you know, a liter at the most. And you can generate enough air out of this to make somebody alive. Now in product in product development, we we'll call this a prototype. You know, so it doesn't have to look sexy. <laughs> But once this is packaged with the nice whistles and bells, you may not even get this clicking. But it's delivery when it's supposed to deliver, you know. But one of our ultimate goal is to be able to connect our systems to more than one patient at a time. Patient? They do one patient at a time. That is the standard. Okay? Because in the hospital environment, you are worried about cross-contamination. But the technology is at a point now where with directional valves, you can control who is getting what. And then with filters, you can ensure that everybody is getting the cleanest part of it. So it's, it's no longer a problem. So Africa doesn't lack talent. Um, what we need to, to do, in my opinion, my honest opinion, is we need to answer the question, what do we want to be when we grow up? what do we want to be when we grow up because if you start from that premise then your policies are shaped around that do we want to be an industrialized country producing all our products if yes what kind of educational system do we need i think our first natural reaction in terms of crisis is to say where is the solution the solution is now and the solution is now because it's driven by special interests there are people in the import export business that are only, the only time they make money is when they bring things in and they sell them. And when you focus on just bringing things in and selling them, you become a commoditized economy. Commoditized economies destroy talent completely. Now, the biggest secret in the world is that America is suffering the same. When I worked in corporate America, nobody was really interested in research and development. People were interested in milking the cow, which means whatever product you have out there, sell more of it but then they have a strategic advantage when there is a threatening technology that is beginning to emerge they'll buy it and integrate it but so because r d was so expensive they didn't want to focus money on it but they could spend millions buying the technology to bring it in we need to develop some of this stuff organically our universities should become centers of excellence where students need to build stuff before they leave I am so proud of these students. These are second year engineering students. You know, that's Banavas Numo. His father delivered it to me at a, some primary school in Koforidia last week. And that's Nathaniel. These are second year engineering students working to solve real life problems. That is what needs to happen in our universities. We cannot afford to say we have grammar style school where people have to come, we train them, and they go into industry and learn. Where are their industries? We need to train them so that they can go out there and create those industries. And that's the mindset that needs to change. We need to reconfigure that.